So, welcome back after the break. Uh, we will continue uh, discussing this topic of gender and diversity, um, focusing a bit more on the workplace communication. Of course, uh, technical communication both written and spoken and workplace communication are both uh, interrelated, uh, but in uh, since in the video module as well towards the end we focus more on classroom uh, communication as well as uh, workplace communication. We are going to be focusing more on this uh, in the next uh, uh, one hour or so. So, uh, in the beginning of uh, uh, the lecture today when I started in the afternoon, uh, I was talking about how uh, we are today communicating in a context which is much more global. So, we are trying to publish articles in journals which are read by people around the world, which are published from uh, major uh, parts of the world. Uh, we are participating in conferences where people from different parts of the world are uh, presenting papers. Uh, in many universities, both public and private in India, we are getting students from other parts of the world, our own students are going to other parts. And uh, in, in our workplaces, whether these are offices, banks, R and D organizations, industry, these are also becoming more global. Uh, we may be working with partners who are from other countries, we may have clients who are from other countries, we have investors who are from other countries. So, the communication is becoming much more global in that context that we are talking more and more to people from so many different countries and nationalities and backgrounds. As a result of this, uh, not only universities and institutions like ours, but many companies in the world also are offering training programs on diversity in communication. So, if for example, you are selected for a position in Infosys today, before you actually start working at Infosys, you will be made to go through a training program on gender and diversity and that is something that is happening in many companies in India and around the world. Now, when we talk about these kinds of competencies, so generally we think of competencies only in subjects, that is domain knowledge in different branches of science, mathematics, technology, engineering and so on. But communication is also a skill that one acquires, one needs certain kinds of knowledge to communicate and knowledge of how to communicate. So, communication is an ability and some of us are naturally good at communication, some of us go through a struggle, some of us need to learn how to communicate better. So, when it comes to being sensitive in communication, here also we are trying to say that uh, these are issues relating to peace and tolerance and equality, which are becoming very important in today's globalized world and these also need to be learnt if we do not already know them. So, some of us because we have been to certain kind of institutions, we are in, born in certain kinds of families, we may be aware of this more than others. So, in uh, many international schools which have sprouted in India also now, as well as in uh, companies which deal with uh, global partners, they are emphasizing skills and knowledge relating to what I have listed in this particular slide, that we are not interested in a very narrow sphere. Suppose you are working in the software sector, it is not simply about software, it is about how software can be applied to different kinds of needs. So, you need an understanding of the world to be a good software engineer. You need to understand different kinds of perspectives because using the same set of programming techniques, you may want to come out with different kinds of solutions depending on your client's needs. So, you have to weigh your perspectives. We not only communicate knowledge, we have to communicate ideas. And as teachers, researchers, academics, that is very important to us because we are not just communicating information we are communicating ideas which is much more complex, which is much more nuanced and therefore, communication is more complex. And those of us who do applied research, we have to apply and take action based on our knowledge. And because we are talking about STEM, we are talking about interdisciplinary knowledge communication. So, because of all these, intercultural communication becomes very important. We have to be very uh, careful to ensure that unconsciously you are not putting off somebody, you are not rubbing a person in the wrong way. So, because we may not understand another person's cultural background, we may not understand 
things from a person's gender ba background. We may not understand things from another person's religion, regional, linguistic backgrounds. There can be problems and those problems can then translate into difficulties in the workplace, which means as a result, the entire uh, workplace may suffer. Therefore, greater uh, willingness to understand each other's socio-cultural background is very important. Greater willingness to communicate with them and ensure that your own ignorance or bias does not come into communication is very important in this particular regard. In general, we say that all communications, all forms of communication has to start from the basic idea of knowing who your audience is. Because we believe that the better you understand your audience, your target audience, whether this is written communication or spoken communication, the better you can tailor your communication and make it more effective. So, whether you are a teacher or a researcher or an administrator, communication has to do all of these things. It has to enable us to be creative and critical. We are not just uh, like very small children, nor are we like other kinds of animals which cannot think creati creatively or critically. Even many animals, a species of the animal world also can be creative. But criticality is something that comes to human beings. So, we want to learn, we want to understand, we want to think about it, reflect on it, improve upon it, criticize it, come up with an alternative and so on. All this is part of education. You can do it better if you understand your audience's background, their limitations, their capacities and then communicate accordingly. Okay? So, if like it was mentioned in the earlier session, one of the teachers mentioned that his students uh, had, some of his students had uh, language deficit and because of that he tried to explain things using uh, practical techniques which made it much more effective. So, that is an excellent example of how you understand your audience and modify your teaching strategy so that that communication becomes effective. And that is what we are saying here that if you are speaking to politicians, if you are speaking to bureaucrats, if you are speaking to people who have a technical knowledge, whether you have men and women in your audience, people of different cultures in your audience, all that has to be factored in into your communication, then it becomes much more effective. In the context of diversity and equality, which is what we are talking about in this module, there are several things we have to ensure and I am mentioning these three here. First is to ensure that in your communication, existing conflicts of society are not reflected. That is conflicts between communities, between men and women, between people of different background, that should not be reflected here. So, if people of different religions are fighting, those biases should not be carried forward into our own research, into our own communication. We need to avoid any misunderstanding. So, if you remember uh, one of my lectures, I mentioned about a class 5 textbook where uh, the author had several sentences about the environment and in all the sentences, the, the, the reference to human beings was always through a masculine noun or pronoun and therefore, there was a misunderstanding on the part of the reader whether uh, the environmental issues are dealt with only by men or also by women. So, since misunderstanding is to be avoided at all ca costs, sensitive issue and diversity issues become important here also because it helps us to be more precise and clear. It also helps us to avoid misinterpretation. We suggest and lot of research also shows that bringing in diversity and equality issues into communication also ensures better learning. So, if for example, you are using language which is not sensitive. So, some people will get put off and even though you may be, you may have an excellent grasp of your subject, they may not be willing to listen to you, they may not be willing to learn from you because you are not sensitive to their needs. So, lot of experiments show that students or somebody who is reading or listening to something can retain that knowledge better if we avoid social biases in our communication. And in my final video module, I also told you about some of the um, pedagogic techniques, techniques of teaching, 
what kind of language to use, how to organize the classroom so that we can make the classroom much more participatory and en enable everybody to learn. So keeping those issues in mind, uh, I would like now to engage in a discussion with you about how you as teachers in your respective colleges and institutions identified different kinds of issues in the classroom. That is, we are focusing specifically on communication in the classroom. What have been your experiences? What kind of problems do you face that we also face here? Problems of learning and communication in a developing country like India with enormous diversity where we have students coming from all over India and where there is also a lot of inequality in terms of what kind of family background they come from, income background they come from, what kind of schools they have been to, um, what kind of educational capacities they have, qualifications they have and so on. Given this diversity and equity, what kind of problems do we face in the classroom? How do we tackle these problems? So I would like to know more of your experiences you know, in, in, in our discussion now for the next few minutes or so. So those who want to um, respond to this question, please raise your hand, we will come to you. The difficulty is that uh, I am teaching in degree engineering college. So basically what happens, there are many students who have done their uh, schooling from Marathi medium, semi as well as from convent. Mm -hmm. So most of the time what happens, those who have done their schooling from Marathi medium, uh, they used to keep themselves. They are able to, means they are having their own group, Marathi medium students are having their own group and uh, uh, semi English medium or we can say convent students are having uh, their uh, different group. Mm -hmm. So how could we tackle this difficulty? So can you just, uh, if, okay. so if you are saying something sir, it could, uh, would be beneficial for me. Okay. So firstly, um, thanks for these questions but uh, do not expect that I will have a ready answer to all these questions. I am also learning to address these issues along with you. We also in IIT experience these issues where students come from different backgrounds and we are working out different solutions. But before I respond to your question about, uh, you know, with reference to what we as teachers do to address similar problems, I want to know from you whether you have done something, whether you have tried something. Actually, sir, uh, I am trying my level best to uh, let them come together. For example, uh, as English is there, means compulsory language or we can say every now and then or whatever they are doing, white or black, mm. that is in English. So I used to tell them that, uh, okay, uh, just uh, be, uh, we can say, uh, do not go with groupism or be sensitive that we must go forward with the help of only English yes. language. So instead of keeping yourself with the groups, mm. yeah. just go forward, just be habitual enough to be with English. Yes. It does not matter that if you have a group, okay, if within that group, just go forward with yeah. English. Yeah. And uh, you know, whenever they are meeting to their teachers, I used to tell them that just you have to use uh, English language. Okay. So I found that uh, improvement is there, sir. So okay. if anything else from your side. Yeah, yeah. So this is a you know common enough problem because it's not simply a question of uh, differences in language abilities, but as you very rightly point out, it also leads to formation of different groups who are segregated. They don't mix with each other. And that is problematic in an educational institution because in an educational institution we want people to learn from each other, not only from teachers. So a lot of learning happens between and among students. So and people, students acquire abilities uh, from each other also. So if uh, students are getting segregated on the basis of uh, semi-English or English and Marathi medium, that is definitely not something to be encouraged. So I will just mention one or two ways of uh, in which we address this here in IIT. One is we have a system of what is called as mentors, student mentors. So some students who have these kinds of difficulties, whether it is language difficulties or other difficulties, we have identified a group of volunteer students who are senior students who are willing to go and engage with these students, talk to them, uh, help them in their work in whatever way possible. So the, the other students are completely free to contact them whenever they want. So I think. Uh, while it is difficult at one go to make these different groups to mix, it will be useful if you can identify a few students from the different, uh, from especially the English medium group who can work and mentor these Marathi medium students. 
that is one way of, but also it is very important to not just look at ability in terms of language. So, as it was mentioned by somebody in the morning, uh, somebody in the, in the in the previous session, uh, there may be a Marathi medium student whose English language capability may be low, but who may be excellent at that particular subject. So, then the mentorship can be reverse also. So, there may be an English speaking student who is poor at uh, mathematics or who is poor in a particular area of mathematics. So, can we ask this Marathi medium student to uh, help that student with those kind of problems. So, making sure that we recognize the different kinds of abilities that students have, encouraging those skills, making them share it, that is one way in which we can uh, you know uh, make more efficient learning happen. The other technique that I have used myself is uh, to go beyond just uh, examination. So, one of the problems that we face is that those who are not good at English tend to do poorly in exams. So, then what we do is number one you can try to give them some projects or assignments. So, somebody who is bad at writing exams may actually be good at assignments or projects because there they get uh, the opportunity to think, to reflect, you know to work on different kinds of ideas which may not be possible in a 300 word answer during the exam where you have a time pressure also. So, give them different kinds of assignments or projects and in IIT we can do that because we have more flexibility. Okay? But something like that can be worked out. Thirdly, uh, you can also make them do presentations in the class where if they are not able to express themselves in English, they can speak in other languages and see if they can explain and over a period of time they will gain the confidence to speak in English as well. Uh, and finally, fourthly, um, we also um, have individual sessions as teachers or with our uh, teaching assistants to explain things in their own language if they are not able to understand in English, so that over a period of time they can improve. So, what we tell them is while we are willing to help you to understand certain things, in the long run it is good for you because somehow India has uh, gone in this direction of using English in higher language. In the long run for your own career it is bet better for you to develop your own abilities. So, we will explain to you, but you put in your effort to also write in English. Okay. So, a variety of methods, a basket of methods will eventually work in uh, bridging these gaps. Uh, sir, the session was very good, the previous session was very good at least. Mm -hmm. As such, there is no question from our side uh -huh. as far as this session is concerned. Okay. But uh, would you like to share something about uh, what kind of problems you face in the classroom in your own colleges while you are teaching with reference to the diversity of background from because you know Indian society is changing, we have more students coming from rural areas, we have a lot of first generation learners. So, Hindi medium, English medium and so on. Would you like to share something of your own experiences? Also, the students are from uh, different background and they are facing major problem in English communication. We are also facing the same problem because many students are from UP board mm -hmm. and they are challenging this issue. But in our university, there is a syllabus of professional communication and faculty members are taking care of that part also. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we have to design our strategies accordingly, but again we are facing this issue because okay. most of the students are from Hindi background and yeah. they are unable to compete as compared to English background. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. okay, thanks for that. So, what the two colleges discussed earlier, we too facing the same problem. Students from their mother tongue languages, they are not ready to, uh, they are lacking of interest in learning English and also scoring marks in the mm -hmm. subject. Apart from that, we also have the girl students who are not ready to accept to attend uh, special classes after classes. They always come with some uh, excuses. Okay. So, by in case of uh, boy students, we, we react, ask them to compulsory. We mm -hmm. made them is compulsory to attend the classes. But in case of girl, okay. we always think about it. They are always considerable okay. and always excusable. Okay. So, they take this as an excuse. Okay. What you are thinking about it? Here okay. also comes there, no? Yeah. Gender and diversity. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so that is where, you know, what we are doing becomes very important because we are using a technology which for which you do not have to be physically present in one particular place. So, maybe for the girl students who find it difficult to stay back after school hours, you can think of other uh, methods of teaching because nowadays we have a lot of uh, online uh, tools where students can learn 
uh, of communication also in some of the schools I, in Bombay, I don't know about other cities, in schools also uh, teachers and students communicate outside of school hours if they want extra sessions. For example, they use uh, some of the video conferencing, Skype techniques through mobile phone and other kinds of techniques. So I know it is not possible everywhere because not everybody has internet, not everybody has a computer, but mobile phones almost everybody has now. So you can think of other ways. Also, uh, um, in uh, some of the uh, experiments being done uh, both in India and abroad, when these kinds of problems are there, within neighborhoods they form groups. So you can form smaller groups of four or five girls who live in the same place and ask them to learn together and then come back and report to the teacher on the next day if they have any doubts. So if you are not able to learn, if you extend the learning sessions in the school, in the college itself, you can try out these other kinds of methods so that they can improve on them. So the topic that uh, the session going on is a sensational one. And we are also accepting there is a gender and diversity all over, mm -hmm. worldwide. But even though still we have a certain thing, we are addressed as uh, God, we are uh, just like that, we address only as uh, in a she form, a girl or woman. And if we address the God, we address only as, take as a man. Okay. But can we make a change in this also? Yes. Is it easy? Is it yeah. possible? Yeah, of course we can, but it's also a matter of faith, you know, because in some religions, there's only one God. In some religions, there are millions of gods. So, and gods can be male, female. We, in Hindu religion, you have Ardha Nareshwara, who is both male and female also. So, this is not so easy to uh, bring about this change because it's a matter of faith also. So, in some religions, they may believe that uh, God is only the ultimate one who does not have gender. In some religions, they may believe that God is a male. So, while we can change the way in which we reference to God, we, we we refer to God, we have to remember that uh, it is also a matter of faith and you cannot uh, impose things on people. So let us go back to the presentation and then uh, we will have another round of discussion. So thanks for uh, sharing your problems, almost all of you seem to have the same problem of language deficits and that is something that really we as a country need to deal with. So we will do a few exercises like we did in the previous session. So I was saying earlier that there are many companies uh, around the world who believe that having a diverse workforce is very important for them and I have given a list of some very big companies in the world. And these are companies which have formal guidelines on gender and diversity sensitive workplaces, gender sensitive communication and so on. So it is not just something that I have cooked up or IIT is interested in, this is a demand from the economy. And somebody like Gary Becker, who is a very famous economist, uh, he actually showed how the more diverse a workplace is, that is more people you have from different backgrounds, the more innovative and profitable a company is. The more homogeneous you are, that is the same kind of people are there in the company, the less innovative it is. And what we also see, is, and there are some uh, comments here from some CEOs who also talk about how in an age of global competition. Uh, you need to be prepared to working with anybody, it does not matter which country, which background they are from, if they have an idea, you have to have them in your company, that is how companies become, organizations become innovative. So given that diversity is given so much value in today's society, uh, how do we ensure that we bring this into our workplace communication aside from technical communication, so we will do a few. Uh, exercises now as part of our tutorials. So this will be a continuation of what we did in the previous session. So what I am going to do, I am going to uh, uh, write, uh, give you certain problematic sentences which are not considered to be acceptable from a gender perspective or from the perspective of other forms of diversity and then uh, offer certain solutions and then see if you can give me some answers. So the first problem is something that I have discussed in my uh, lecture, where there is there has been a tendency for a very long time to use the noun man as a generic noun to represent all human beings. So one solution we can give is to use alternatives to the word man, alternatives to masculine nouns which are available. 
so that we are more inclusive in our communication. So the solution one that I am giving you here is to use alternative nouns like human or person or mortal or humankind and so on which are alternatives to the masculine noun man and include all human beings men, women, third gender, other gender and so on. So let me take a sentence uh, from a research article. So the effect of PCBs, so I will not explain what is PCB, you are all from science and engineering institutions, if you do not know you can still look it up. The effect of PCBs has been studied extensively in rats and man. So suppose I want you to use that solution one to replace man, so what do you do? The effect of PCBs has been studied extensively in rats and what do you say? So can I get an answer from somebody? Uh, rats and human. Okay, rats and human. Okay, can we take another uh, answer from somewhere else? Uh, the answer is rats and human. Yeah, so the, uh, both of you are almost correct because uh, when we use the word man in this particular case, we are referring it, we are using man not as a singular but as a plural. That is, we are referring to mankind or humanity or human beings. Therefore, we have to say rats and humans. Okay, it is not just rats and human because human does not refer to all human. Human refers to a characteristic of being human as different from being an animal. But humans refer to people. So it has to be rats and humans. Okay, but you are right. Can we go back to the slide? The same problem where we have the masculine noun man or men or its different uh, variations, uh, we can also use what is called as an inclusive compound word or a descriptive word that is it actually describes what that work is about. So for example, we have a lot of words where man or men is used to refer to what a person is doing like a chairman okay, or a workman and so on. So in the examples that I have given, you can see there is like some instead of chairman or chairwoman, you can use just chair to chair a session, you can use chairperson or you can use what is called as an inclusive compound word or a descriptive word as a presider, somebody who presides over a function, somebody who is a convener. Okay? So that is another way in which you can avoid the use of the masculine noun man. So here we have a sentence that is the governor signed the workmen's compensation bill. The workmen's compensation act is actually a real act in India. So how will you change the word workmen? So I will not, uh, I am not going to go to you, I will ask you, come back to you for the next question. This is fairly simple. Uh, the governor, the correct answer would be the governor signed the workers compensation bill. The reason I am putting it here is that the word worker has been available to us for centuries. The word worker is much more simple than workmen. Why then do we use words like workmen which refer only to men when we have workers who are both men and women and they have been workers for a long time. So that indicates the origin of gender insensitive language because for a long time it was only men who were writing and they were referring to themselves. Therefore terms like workmen, workman and all came into existence even though a term, a neutral term like worker actually existed but we simply did not use them. Okay. So, uh, just to you know, um, uh, provide you an insight into how these words originated, I was giving this example, but I will come back to you for the next question to take some answers. Now let me take, let, you, can be, you can have a different kind of solution. So what we are trying to do here is to suggest that the kind of problems we face when we use gender insensitive language or gender exclusive language, there are lots of ways in which we can rectify our language. And I am just trying to give you four or five different examples of how we can address the problem, same problem in many different ways. Now here we can use a gender specific pronoun to identify a specific gender or a specific person. That is sometimes we may want to mention the gender, we do not want to avoid gender some, in some cases, we want to be specific, we want to refer to men or women. Okay? because that is part of what we want to explain. So sometimes we want to avoid gender altogether, we want to be neutral, sometimes we want to be specific. So suppose you have a question like this, 
repeat the question for each subject so that he understands it. So it may be for example, uh, a researcher who is doing research among human subjects, among human beings. So I am giving you a questionnaire, I am asking some questions and I want them to understand before responding. So I will give this instruction to my assistant who is carrying out this research. So I will say repeat the question for each subject so that he understands it. Now suppose I want you to rewrite this question using a gender specific pronoun to identify a specific gender. How will you rewrite it? What is a gender fair way of doing it? Because I have talked earlier in the video module about gender fair, gender neutral and gender aware. Okay? So how will you do this in a gender fair way? So can you fill up those blanks, repeat the question for dash dash so that he fully understands it. Gender fair way would be each person. Each person. I am asking you to imagine a situation where you want to mention a specific gender. In such cases it cannot be called as gender biased. So the correct answer would be repeat the question for each male subject for each male. So we are sub male subject. So in that case one is being gender fair because if one knows that one is going to look at only males or only females, in that case you can be specific because if you say repeat the question for each subject so that he understands it, we do not know if the subject is only male or they are both male and female. Therefore, it is ambiguous and ambiguity is not acceptable in technical communication. Whereas, if we want to say that the subjects are only male, then one can say repeat the question for each male subject so that he fully understands it. Okay? In that case, we are being fair, we are not being biased. Okay? Yeah. So, thanks for uh, your response. Let us go to solution 4. So, there is another way in which we can do this. We can as we did in the previous session, we can use plural nouns and pronouns so long as they do not change the meaning of the sentence. Okay? Be careful they do not change. So, the same sentence I will take. Repeat the question for each subject so that he understands it. So, here we are assuming that subjects can be both male and female and third gender. So, what how can we use plural nouns? So, what how will you rephrase this sentence? What will you put in that blank? Repeat the question for dash so that they understand it. Yeah, uh, for the second question, uh, repeat the questions for the peoples so that they can understand it. Uh, see, we are using the word subject. Now, subject is a technical term. That is when we are doing a uh, survey, we are referring to the people among whom we are doing survey as a subject. So, which means that you cannot substitute subject with people because people is a very general term. So, can you think of an alternative answer? It should be repeat the question for each male and female subject so that they can understand it. Uh, no, no, I am asking you to use, we are using, we want you to use plural nouns and pronouns. So, the plural pronoun is already there. So, that they, they is the plural pronoun. Okay? So, one way is as you say, you can say repeat the question for male and female subjects. That is, uh, so you change subject into subjects, you make it plural. Okay? So, that is one way of doing it. Any other way of doing it without bringing in gender? Without specifying the gender, all, all male and female subjects yeah. to that yeah. yeah. So one of the, if you remember, one of the things that I mentioned in my video, in my lecture, I said avoid mentioning gender if it's not relevant. So then we can just say repeat the question for all subjects, so that they understand it. Okay. So that's uh, also a correct answer. Thanks. Can we go to the next uh, question, please? Now there's a fifth and a sixth way of doing it also. So, one could use a third person. So, we know about first person, second person, third person, we studied it in primary school, I, you and then he, her, they and so on. So, we have a sentence here which says, this, so this is a instruction. Suppose you are going to the RTO office to get your driver's license without going through the agent and paying a bribe. So, you can say, you have to say this, the driver should take his completed registration form to the clerk's window and pay his license fee. 
So, we would like to avoid the use of the word his which is used twice because uh, that sentence assumes that all the drivers are only men. Okay? Now, in a gender fair way how will you rewrite this? So, you have to fill up three blanks here by using a third person pronoun plural singular I would not say that I will leave it to you, but uh, the, you can guess which is the correct one. So, where shall we go? Driver should take their registration form and uh, fill their registration fee. Okay, so you got it absolutely correct first shot. <laughs> okay, so that is the right answer. So, we are using third person pronouns here. So, instead of and we are using the plural form of the noun. So, instead of the driver, we are saying drivers should take their completed registration forms to the clerk's window and pay their license fee. So, we are using a combination of the plural form of the driver which is a noun and the plural form of the pronoun his which is there. So, when you change something from first second person like his and her to uh, sorry when you uh, change the uh, third person from singular to plural automatically the gender becomes uh, you know you do not specify the gender of a person it becomes gender neutral that is one way of doing it. So, changing it from singular to plural now pronoun makes it gender neutral or gender fair. Okay. So, we will take one more um, here instead of third person in solution 6 I am asking you to use first person. So, again uh, uh, we will just yeah. the principal investigator for this report has appended data tables to his summary. So, suppose I have a project from the department of science and technology government of India and I am the principal investigator. So, I have uh, uh, prepared a report of the project and I am sending a report with this sentence. So, gender fair man gender fair uh, rewriting of the sentence using first person how do you do it? We have appended we have data appended. tables mm -hmm. to the summary of this report. Okay. I would not uh, say whether you are right or wrong you are partly correct let us take up another college and then I will come back. So, the answer is I, I have appended the data tables to prepare summary of this report. Okay. So, thank you for that uh, uh, answer that is correct. So, we would have been correct. So, the IPS Academy indoor um, please uh, if you see the sentence it talks about a principal investigator which is one and we also use the word his which is a singular third person pronoun. So, therefore, if, if we if we had mentioned the principal investigators then we would have been correct since we is also first person it is a first person plural. So, uh, in, in, in this case I is more appropriate since we are talking about one single principal investigator. Now, the reason I included this example even though it is fairly simple is that you can see that the gender fair or gender neutral version is actually much more simpler as a sentence. So, when we write uh, in technical communication we are asked to be as simple as possible not to make it too complicated we have to be as clear as possible. So, in some ways as you see there by not being gender sensitive you are also being very complicated the principal investigator for this report has appended data tables to his summary which is a passive voice which is a very long sentence. Whereas, the other correct version is actually a very much simpler sentence and a shorter sentence also. Okay. So, that is also an another advantage of using gender sensitive language. We can also use what are called as double pronouns like earlier we looked at examples like his and her, himself, herself, himself and herself which are pronoun pairs or we also as one of your colleagues said they are called as bulky pronouns. Now, you also can use double pronouns where uh, you just write s slash h e which makes it she or he. So, this you can use when you write because it is very difficult to pronounce those words you cannot say s slash he. Okay. While writing we can use those uh, while speaking we can say he or she, he, she, him and hers and so on. So, in this particular sentence each supervisor will be at his workstation by 8 am this may be an instruction given 
to a person working in an office. So, you can just say each supervisor will be at his or her workstation by 8 am. Uh, the final solution that is given here is to use an article. So, we all know about pronouns, pronouns are I, me, he, his, they and so on, but we also have articles which is a, an and the. So, like in the solution 6 that I offered, we see that substituting a pronoun with an article also makes the sentence simpler. So, in this particular example, we are saying after filling out his class schedule, the student should place it in the registrar's basket. So, here we are referring to the student as a male, whereas it may be a female as well. So, here the solution would be to say after filling out the class schedule. So, we are using the definite article T H E D, student should place it in the registrar's basket, which, which completely avoids the gender issue altogether, it does not even bring it in because it is not relevant to us. Okay. So, what we have done in these 8 examples is to take the problem of using gender specific nouns and pronouns to refer to all human beings and then see how we can modify those sentences to make them uh, gender fair, gender neutral and so on. So, like we did in the earlier session, uh, I would like to uh, you to ask some questions either to me or to other participants and to share your experiences. And here we are going to share experiences related to three issues. So, I would like you to uh, raise some questions and share experiences on teaching, uh, communication of research either in conferences, papers, publications, books and so on or uh, in everyday workplace communication related to administration, uh, how we communicate with each other, with each other related to running of an institution. So, uh, in the morning for example, uh, one of the participants mentioned about a letter from us which actually was not following our own rules. So, then uh, it is possible that such kind of uh, uh, communication issues with reference to administration between and among you could be there in your institutions also. So, I would like you to share experiences of those and also based on my lectures, if you have any particular questions or clarifications, you can ask them now. Yes, it is better. During this session, we have learnt about how to go with the gender differentiation and how to form sentences. This, uh, when it comes to the teaching assignment for the students, how best we can explain to the students with uh, taking as the examples of uh, your assignment. Mm -hmm. how, okay. So, the examples that I gave are fairly simple examples uh, from everyday kind of communication that we have. So, you will have to design specific examples from your own communication context. What kind of emails you send out to your students, what kind of letters you send out, what kind of forms do you have make them fill up. So, and uh, what kind of questions do you ask them in the classroom, in the laboratory, uh, in oral or viva exams and so on. So, you will have to find out the context in which these are applicable and then uh, redesign the language. So, uh, I cannot give a more specific ex example unless I know the uh, specific kind of communication that you are involved in. Some examples of sentences if you can give me, then I can tell you how to modify those sentences. And one more question sir, mm -hmm. uh, like the students after getting, uh, after understanding this, when they present it in the examination, like during the examinations, how they will be presenting it in written form? Uh -huh. Because they got habituated yes. listening to us the way we present it. And the same thing they may be repeating in the examination, yes. in the written form. Yes. So, how to avoid this for explaining them, uh, the students, uh, in a better way? Uh, okay. So, see these kind of changes in communication do not happen overnight. So, these are things that have to be uh, sort of drilled into all of us for over a period of time before we modify the language because we, as you said, we have become habituated to writing and speaking in particular ways. So, uh, one suggestion that we give to our students here is to have a checklist. 
So just as you know, when suppose you are publishing an article, you will be given certain guidelines about uh, what style to follow, how to uh, provide references and so on. So uh, we suggest that uh, even for addressing gender and sensitivity issues, you can have a checklist or a set of guidelines so that when you, whether you are writing an answer in an exam or writing an assignment or writing a project report, you can actually see whether these guidelines have been met or not. I don't remember now whether uh, I have given you those kind of guidelines um, in the list of uh, material that we have uploaded. But uh, if you go to uh, some of the journals in your own field or if you go to the professional associations, for example, there is the IEEE or there is American Society of Mechanical Engineers. So these organizations, professional organizations have these guidelines that when you communicate, what you should verify, what you should check for, so that your language is not biased or it's not insensitive. So telling your students that in writing an exam or an assignment, you have to follow these guidelines, that makes them much more conscious of these issues when they write. Okay? Yeah. So yeah. let's move. Last question. Okay. Yeah, like the question. students when they enter into the corporate world, mm -hmm. whatever the learning that has taken place in the classroom, they forget. And that too will be totally different to that when the work, uh, yeah. when it is in the work environment. Yeah. So how best we can suggest? Yeah. yeah. This is in fact a very major issue uh, because a lot of uh, studies done by industrial bodies like FIKI and ASOCHAM and CII as well as more academic studies show that there is a big gap between the skills that are required when people join a firm and the skills they are taught in the work in, in, in the educational institution. So and this applies both to communication as well as to the domain knowledge in different fields. So this is a much larger problem which requires uh, that there is better coordination between uh, educational institutions and uh, uh, various kinds of uh, organizations which employ people. But what we would suggest is at least that uh, 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 educational institutions make some effort to find out what kind of skills are required in the workplace and see if that can be incorporated into uh, your own uh, educational uh, uh, curriculum, syllabi, strategies and so on. So, uh, and that applies to communication also because this is seen as one of the big gaps why a uh, lot of students are not employable is because they may be very good in their fields but communication is lacking. So here again we need to find out exactly which kind of communication skills are required for which kind of jobs and then see if we can impart them not only through special courses on technical communication but also through the way in which you teach your own courses. So if you remember the inaugural session on Monday, Professor Mart Fatak mentioned this point. He said do not think of communication as a separate course in itself. Communication skills has to be imparted in each and every course that we teach. So if we can ensure that people communicate better their own subjects in which they have better knowledge, then they become better communicators and that also matches well with the requirements of communication in when they join an organization for a job. Okay? So thanks for those questions. We, uh, we'll, we are going to take this question from KMEA Engineering College, Alua, uh, but before that, I would like to say that the next couple of questions, uh, I would like colleges to think of sharing their experiences because so far you have been asking questions and that is understandable. But we also uh, expect that you are teachers, so you are like us and you face similar problems and we imagine that you also would have tried to come up with solutions to this kind of communication issues. So if you face communication issues in the workplace in your own institutions, how do you attempt to address these problems? If you can share them, that will be very useful for all of us. So we will go to Aluwa now. Uh, uh, one good thing about this uh, technical communication workshop was that we were able, uh, that is uh, the main problem we face with the students they, when they come for the project or research or in-depth work. Uh, when, when they ask for the structure of the abstract or uh, structure of the uh, report they want to write, 
we'll, we don't have a, like an SOP how to actually structure the format. But when, yeah. uh, when we go into this uh, technical communication workshop, we actually got the actual procedure or, yes. uh, or how to give the structure mm -hmm. to uh, guide them. Okay. It was one of the main advantage we got out of this workshop. Thank you. Yeah. So that's, uh, in fact, you know, that's one of the things that we, uh, we all try to impart to our students. The structure is extremely important because the structure uh, gives a form to the content. It, may, it organizes the material in a particular sequence and order, which makes it much more comprehensible and easily understandable for a leader or a listener. So the structuring of a report or of a presentation is very important. I'm glad you got that out of this course. Thanks for the feedback. Sir, in uh, writing the technical papers, may I know how to mention uh, me and uh, I? Uh, okay, this is, uh, this actually depends on different subjects because in different subjects they have different preferences. So, and it also depends on the preference of a university. In some universities, for example, when you submit a thesis or a dissertation, you are allowed to use first person like I, me and so on. In some institutions, you are expected to use third person like, uh, you know, you are, uh, you are referring, supposed to refer to yourself as a third person like the researcher and so on. So, uh, the answer to your question is, it depends on the guidelines that are given. So, some professional associations, some journals, publishers, universities, they all have their own guidelines of how to use I and me vis-a-vis. Um, referring to ourselves in the third person like the researcher. So, you have to find out the guidelines and use them appropriately. Okay, when we are going for anti-plagiarism, how to uh, avoid this me and I problem, sir? Uh, okay, anti-plagiarism. So, that is, uh, see what I, I think you are, what you are referring to is when we are rewriting other people's ideas or materials in one's own words. Okay? I think that is what you are referring to, so that we make sure that when we are representing somebody else's ideas, um, we are not copying or we are not unconsciously indulging in plagiarism. And in this case, actually using first person like I, me and so on is helpful because it helps you to organize your thoughts in your own words. Whereas, if you just reproduce what somebody has said, then that becomes plagiarism. But if you begin thinking of it in from your own point of view that I am saying this, that I wish to make this argument, I wish to suggest that this should be interpreted in a particular way, I wish to report this result, I have observed these experimental results. If you say it in that way, it becomes easy to avoid plagiarism also and it avoids the gender problem as well. Uh, I would like to ask uh, one question based on the teaching where uh, like uh, in some of the curriculum or uh, the syllabus which is having a basic concept but sometimes what happen that uh, the frequently the application of the version in the curriculum which comes so uh, up to your knowledge within a how many period that we have to update the curriculum. One course which we are teaching uh, over here, uh -huh. where actually it is required to include some basic concept. Okay. But sometimes what happened that in our industry, various version of the syllabus which comes. So, it is required to update frequently or we have to keep as it is, which contains the basic concept. Okay. No, I think, uh, see, both are required, especially undergraduate level. Students have to be uh, strong in their concepts. If you are not strong in concepts, then, you know, uh, it's very difficult for you to sustain yourself uh, in any profession. But updation is also required because knowledge is changing very frequently these days. And uh, uh, you, so you need a balance of both, but uh, as far as uh, uh, the communication, technical communication skills is concerned, it's always better to find out 
what kind what is expected from industry since you are asking about industry what is the kind of skills that they expect of course it's not possible to keep changing every 6 months or every one year because then uh, you know we are just following trends and we are not focusing on fundamentals so conceptual uh, rigor is very much required so um, in different subjects or different fields depending on the job potential also one has to arrive at an optimum uh, combination of constantly updating the syllabus vis-a-vis -vis, uh, laying a strong foundation. Uh, one thing I want to say here is that uh, in this particular example uh, question that you have raised, it is important that we do not get lost in the constant demands that industry makes of us. Because industry or companies uh, will come for placement and they will say today I want this skill, tomorrow I want something else and we keep chasing those and we do not forget to focus on uh, the fundamental concepts and theories and methods of any particular subject. So, uh, constantly one has to keep uh, trying to find out which kind of skills lay a strong foundation among the students and which are required to get a job in the job market. So, the maintaining that optimum combination is somewhat easier in an IIT because we have more flexibility in changing our syllabus and what we teach. Nobody is going to ask us, but I know you all have board of studies and uh, you know all kinds of academic councils. So, but keeping that interaction going between the employers and your own uh, colleges, even if you can informally introduce some of the updates, I think that will benefit the students in the long run. Sir, uh, I would like to share my experience uh, uh, of teaching communication skills. Okay. And I have observed that uh, if you, if we talk about gender biasness, so I have personally experienced that girls are uh, far better than uh, boys in learning communication skills as well as they, they take it as a very important subject okay. as well as it, they understand that in career uh, communication skills are very important okay. to build their or to, to proceed their careers uh, in a positive direction. Okay. That is my observation. Okay. And uh, I would like to ask a question also. Uh, could you please uh, throw some light upon? Hello. Yes. Uh, could you please throw some light upon uh, differentiation of uh, why why the girls are better uh, understanding in communication skills? Okay. And. Uh, they, they, they have seriousness of the subject and they understand that it is very useful for their, uh, for building up their career. Okay. Yeah. I am actually, I do not know much about this, but my mother has a theory. My mother says that, you know, once uh, girls uh, grow up and get married, then they are not allowed to speak so much. That is why they are better at communication before marriage, you know, because that is the only chance they get to speak. Okay. So, uh, I am not sure if that is a... Uh, good theory, but I think uh, maybe there are other factors and one needs to uh, research them. But I think uh, because you know there is there are all kinds of issues, these could be issues related to how confident students are about communication, uh, how uh, curious they are to ask and find out uh, about uh, different kinds of problems to obtain knowledge. It could be uh, uh, related to uh, the gender balance within a classroom. So, for example, uh, sometimes teachers tell us that if there are more girls than boys in a class, then boys tend to be shy and not ask so many questions. If it is the other way around, then girls are uh, uh, you know hesitant to ask questions. Uh, it, it also depends on family background, it depends on what kind of educational institutions they have been to and so on. There are a number of factors. So, uh, Gujarat of course, you know, because Gujarat has had a longer tradition of uh, education. So, it is possible that uh, the gaps between boys and girls are not so big as it is in some other states. Uh, so, uh, I do not know if it is peculiar to your particular uh, area or it is more common to the state, but it is an interesting question that you raise and uh, I have not re really seen uh, any evidence which can help me to answer this because one finds different kinds of situations. In some cases, it is the boys who speak more, in some cases, it is the girls who speak more. Okay? But I, I suspect that there is a combination of factors which explains this. But from our
communication perspective, what is important is firstly that you make sure girls don't stop communicating after some time and you ensure that boys also are able to communicate and share information. How to ensure that everybody is able to share and communicate? That is the strategy that we should be striving for. Please. I wanted to ask one question. How much amount of plagiarism is acceptable in a technical paper? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, theoretically zero. <laughs> okay. But uh, see what happens is uh, sometimes um, um, there is especially when it comes to technical communication, you can only express something in a few ways. You cannot explain things in many different ways. So it is possible that somebody else has written about the research that you are doing in exactly the same way. Likewise, much of the plagiarism software also includes references and bibliography as plagiarism. So if somebody else cites an article and I cite it, it will be exactly the same. So I think about uh, gen, I don't, it differs from one institution to another, but generally about 20 to 25 is regarded as acceptable because these can happen by accident or this can happen by coincidence. But anything beyond that is regarded as not acceptable. But theoretically it should be zero. Okay? Okay. So thank you. Thank you so much. So I, with this we come to an end. Uh, we, we conclude this session. So I think there will be other people coming in later. Uh, I also wish to thank all of you for giving us this opportunity to share uh, our own experiences and uh, the kind of uh, teaching we do in this class to all of you. And I have also learned a lot from all of your questions and uh, uh, sharing your experiences. Thank you very much. Go and enjoy your tea.